Hello, I'm Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Linda Carpenter, who is a professor of psychiatry in the Alpert Medical School of Brown University and director of the Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation Clinic at Butler Hospital. She is an expert in transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is the subject we will discuss today. Dr. Carpenter, welcome to The Therapy Show. Thank you so much for inviting me to your program. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development that led to your research in the field of transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is more commonly referred to as TMS? I've always been interested in the brain. I've always been interested in mental health. And in college, I majored in psychology. And then I worked in a depression research program for a couple of years before going to medical school. And I thought, oh, man, research is so cool. You can find the answers. So then after medical school, I did my specialized training, my residency in psychiatry. And I also took on some extra training so I could be a researcher because I wanted my career to be one where I was involved in developing new treatments and really pushing the boundaries. Then I came to Brown University and Butler Hospital and started my life as a physician scientist in 1997. And most of the time since I've been doing this, I've focused on mood and anxiety disorders like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. So I take care of patients. I take care of patients who are in research programs and also patients who are not. And I run clinical trials. And these clinical trials, I get to try out new treatments and patients volunteer who have depression or anxiety disorders. And they are in a trial to see if the new treatments are safe and if they're effective and if they work to reduce their symptoms. Some of the treatments that I've been involved in as a researcher have been drugs, like new antidepressant medications and things like intranasal esketamine. And others of the treatments that I've been researching are treatments that are delivered by devices using some energy to stimulate the brain and to stimulate the brain to reduce symptoms, symptoms of depression or anxiety. And so I've been involved with clinical research involving TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, for over a decade now. And in my daily life now, I continue to investigate new and different ways to use TMS ever since it was FDA approved, which was back in 2008. And I also study other devices that are also use energy fields and also new drugs, primarily for depression and anxiety disorders. How would you briefly explain TMS to a non-professional? TMS, I would say, is a non-invasive brain stimulation treatment, and it's delivered typically in once daily sessions that last anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour, and patients come in, they drive themselves in, they're awake and they're alert. It's different from ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy or something that's commonly called shock therapy. It's different from that because You're not under anesthesia or sedation. You come in, you're sort of laying in a dentist chair type of device, and there's a thing placed on your head, and it pulses magnetic energy in through your scalp and your skull to your brain. And it doesn't really cause the characteristic side effects like medications do. And it's a device that can be given to people who are taking medications, but it's also a treatment that works to get people better who are not taking medications. So that's how I describe it to a therapist or to a patient. Researchers also will often talk about TMS as a research tool because when it's not used as a therapy, it's often used in laboratories to manipulate certain brain regions. You can kind of turn a a various function or specific location in your brain on or off. And it's used to help researchers understand how the brain is processing information and what the functions are in various parts of the brains or circuits of the brain. So I would say it's a research tool and it's also a non-invasive therapy, brain stimulation therapy. What are some of the conditions you would treat with TMS? There are two that are FDA approved. And the first of these is major depressive disorder. Back in 2008, there was enough data from large scale clinical trials to show that it was effective and safe for the treatment of major depressive disorder in people who had not benefited from antidepressant medications. So that was the first condition that was adopted into clinical practice for TMS as a therapy. Now, more 
recently, there have been a number of clinical trials, research trials that evaluated uh, whether TMS could be useful for OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder. And that more recently got an FDA approval. Not all TMS devices have the right exact equipment to deliver the OCD treatment, but all of the available devices, and there are six or seven now FDA approved devices that are marketed for the treatment of major depressive disorder. And just to clarify, a major depressive disorder, which is what people commonly call depression, is a disorder that is characterized by a lot of different types of symptoms in addition to having problems with mood, a bad mood or an irritable mood. There are problems with inability to experience joy and pleasure. And there are also symptoms that we call neurovegetative symptoms. Those are disturbances in things like sleep and appetite and libido. And there are problems with concentration and thinking and negative thoughts. What is not FDA approved yet is a different flavor of depression, which is called bipolar disorder depression. So the condition that's FDA approved and which insurance companies cover is non-bipolar or what psychiatrists sometimes call unipolar depression. And they unipolar because there's one pole, which is the down part of the spectrum and not the up or the manic side that is seen with bipolar disorder. So um, major depressive disorder and OCD are the two conditions. So if somebody had OCD, they'd want to make sure that, that the provider had that particular device? That's right. If you were interested in getting TMS therapy for OCD, you would have to ask the clinic or the practitioner if they have the specific device that's FDA approved for OCD. And there are different types of geometries of a something called a coil, which I'll explain to you in a moment, which is a, a part of the TMS equipment that's placed on the patient's head and determines which areas of the brain are getting stimulated. And the clinical trials that were done with uh, patients who had OCD were all done with one specific type of device and the type of coil that uh, is thought to reach the areas of the brain that are important to stimulate for OCD. All of the devices have the capacity and have demonstrated safety and efficacy one way or another to treat major depressive disorders. So it's really only a subset of TMS clinics that are able to also offer treatment for OCD. And you would have to confirm that with a provider. So can you explain the process of how TMS works on the brain? So TMS is a treatment that's delivered by strong magnetic fields. And we're not talking about magnets like the kind you stick on your refrigerator or the strong buckyballs that stick together. We're talking about a different kind of energy that's created by electricity. So if you took a bunch of copper wire, for example, and you looped it around and around, we're going to call that a coil. That's a coil of wires that conducts electricity. And then if you put electricity through those loops of wire on and off, on and off, that's going to create a magnetic field coming out of that coil. And when you turn it on and off and on and off quickly, that makes a pulse of magnetic energy that comes out of that coil. That coil is that loop. And so basically, you make a magnetic energy and it comes out in a pulsed kind of fashion. And when you take pulses of magnetic field like that and you hold them next to something else that also can conduct electricity, you will actually can induce an electrical current in that other thing. So if you held this coil next to a wire, you could cause electrical current to start up in that wire just from the pulses of a magnetic field. That's called Faraday's law of physics. Now the brain has cells inside of it that are called neurons and they have properties so that they can conduct electricity similar to how electrical wires do. And so when someone takes a TMS coil, which is a device with kind of these loops of wires and it's inside a plastic case, so you can't actually see those wires. You just see uh, something that's kind of round and covered in plastic or sometimes it's in a little bit of a helmet and you put that on your head and it applies pulses of magnetic field. They go through your scalp and your skin and your skull bones. They go right through to the brain cells underneath and then those brain cells are activated. They are a little current is induced in them. And that's how brain cells work. Neurons actually kind of conduct electrical impulses from one to another in connected fashion. And they make circuits and they make networks in the brain. So when you activate these brain cells right underneath the magnet coil that's sitting on the patient's head, you're activating and stimulating those neurons and they make connection with other areas of the brain that are further away, deeper in the brain, either side of the brain, through circuits and networks in ways that our brain is already functionally connected. 
It's working by stimulating and activating neurons in the area of the brain called the cortex, and specifically the front area of the brain called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And that just is a lot of word to show where we point to on the sort of front part of the head and typically on the left side of the head. And TMS, we know, works to make these changes. Now, the million dollar question is, how does making those changes lead to an antidepressant effect? How does it make your symptoms go away? How does it make you sleep better at night and feel more joyful in life? And this is a million dollar question for all of our treatments. We don't actually know how any of our antidepressants do this. We don't know how psychotherapy does this. And we don't know how TMS does this. So we know what it does. We know that your drug like Prozac sticks to this part of a receptor and a neuron in a cell in the brain. But then the subsequent steps of how that makes our symptoms go away is still a bit of a mystery and something that researchers are working to understand. But we know that TMS activates these brain cells called neurons in the cortex. And we know that it changes connections through the brain and that as those things happen, symptoms gradually get better. Do things like depression or OCD change the brain and inactivate some of these neurons? When somebody has a disorder like depression, we'll stick with depression for now, or OCD, you can study the connections in their brain between different regions. Think of it like a computer, and there's this area that contributes something, and this one's supposed to block inputs of that during certain times. And it uh, could be a case where things are dysregulated. So let's think about anxiety. There's an area of your brain called the amygdala, which is in charge of giving you kind of fear and arousal and caution signals. And we all need to have those fear and caution signals and arousal that make us worried if there's a train coming or if something dangerous is about to happen. We need those signals to tell our brain to become worried and activate. But when those signals can't be turned off, when you're in a safe environment, you're at home, you're around your loved ones, and you're still having having those signals of concern and fear and worry, then it may be the case that another area of the brain who's supposed to be the top-down controller, we talk about the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex as being sort of this executive that's supposed to say, nope, you get to turn off now. There's no reason for you to send those signals of anxiety. We're not in an anxious situation. That maybe that regulation isn't working. It can be that not that certain areas of the brain are missing or are injured, but it may be that the traffic, the types of inputs and the regulators that say, okay, this is a good time to feel sad. Somebody just died. My cat just died. I feel lost. I feel empty. But those signals should not be coming up to the forefront and occupying our thoughts and our mind all day when we're not in a sad situation, when we're in a normal, happy, everyday situation. So it could be that it's just a miscoordination of a lot of different types of signals and inputs that come into one kind of control center that's not uh, regulating the control process properly. So when we talk about connections, we're often talking about functional connections, like this part of the brain, which does this job, shouldn't be talking to this part of the brain now, or it's talking too much, or it's getting too much airtime, uh, that sort of a way. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Are there any side effects or risks to being treated with TMS? It's an interesting thing. When you first sit and have a TMS coil placed on your head, usually reclined in a chair, and this sitting left side of your head, typically up near your forehead, but not over your eyes, and the tapping starts the first day, it sounds a little like a tap sound, like that, that the coil makes when the magnetic pulses are coming out of it. And it feels a little like there's a woodpecker pecking on your head. There's like this little pokey sensation underneath the coil on your scalp. And there's also these little superficial nerves that we all have through our skin everywhere and including on our scalp. In fact, if you raise your eyebrows or wiggle your ears or smile, you can feel muscles moving all over your forehead. And there's little nerves that control those muscles. So if the TMS magnetic pulse is stimulating and it just happens to bump into one of those muscles and the, the nerves that contract them, that you can have some twitching very slight twitching on your forehead or around the left side of your face up above your ear when it's pulsing on you, when it's tapping. So there's this little feeling like a woodpecker and it gets milder and milder over time. So if you're doing a treatment that's a half hour, the very first time you experience it feels kind of, oh, poke, kind of sharp, sharp, sharp. And then maybe five, 10 minutes later, it feels kind of more dull. And then the next day you come for treatment and it feels really dull, like somebody's sap softly tapping your head in that spot and no longer like it's a pokey feeling. And then sometimes after a week or two of daily treatments, it may often actually feel kind of soothing. And sometimes people are inclined to fall asleep during their treatment, which they should not do. But 
but it's something that people accommodate very quickly. So that's one of the main side effects is this sensation of the pulsing of the field. And again, nothing's actually hitting you, just an energy that's pulsing against your skin and you can feel that. And then other side effects uh, relate to the fact that if the TMS device, the coil that delivers these pulses, is not placed in the proper spot on your head, it could have a different effect than what's desired. So if you took that TMS coil and you put it over a spot further back toward your ears, you would be over a strip of brain called the motor cortex. And when you stimulate that area, you can actually put a pulse in your head and actually see a twitch in your hand on the opposite hand from the side where pulse is delivered. And that's actually a part of the procedure when we're calibrating how much intensity of these magnetic pulses should we use. It's a personalized treatment that the first step is we figure out how excitable you your own brain is. And then we calibrate the whole treatment when we go to to, uh, stimulate the front areas of your brain so that it matches your own brain's level of excitability. But if you left the coil back there and you were stimulating on that area called the motor cortex, there would be a, a risk that you could actually induce a seizure. You could cause excitation to build up in an area of the brain that's responsible for movement in the arms and the legs. And so one of the actually extremely rare side effects of TMS is induction of a seizure. Now, to put that in perspective, there are a number of antidepressant medications that also have risk for inducing a seizure. And during the first couple of years when we had TMS as a therapy, again, it was FDA approved the first device in October 2008. It wasn't really clear exactly how significant this risk was because in the clinical trials, there had been very few cases, maybe one in 10,000. But then over the years, now there have been an estimated 20 million TMS treatments since that first FDA approval. Now we know that the risk of inducing a seizure is extremely low. Still, nevertheless, we screen for people who might have some sort of injury in their brain that would increase their risk for having a seizure. You wouldn't want to go to your doctor to get treated for your depression or your OCD and have a seizure because when someone has a seizure, they often thrash about and they could injure themselves. A seizure is usually stopped within a minute and is self-limited and people are confused for a while and they wake up, but you certainly wouldn't want to have that happen. So when uh, doctors are evaluating a patient who might be appropriate for TMS therapy, they're going to learn whether or not they have a history of epilepsy or other type of seizure disorder because that could place them at additional risk. It's not really a side effect, it's a potential risk. But again, now 20 million treatments later, we know that the risk of having a seizure induced with TMS is extremely lower than it is just taking some antidepressant medications. But those are the main side effects, Uh, the kind of twitching in your face, this woodpecker feeling, and some twitching around your head at the, particularly the first couple sessions, and then other sorts of things that can happen. And those may be a function of whether or not you're taking certain medications at the time that you're having TMS therapies. In general, doctors see that some of the side effects from stimulating medicines, like if people take stimulants for attention deficit disorder, those aren't a great combination together with daily TMS therapy. Depending on the stimulation protocol that's used, sometimes people can feel kind of over caffeinated or a little excessively energized if they're taking stimulants and getting TMS. But if that's discussed with the clinician, there's steps they can take to either change the stimulation parameters or adjust the medications to resolve that problem. Do you think training in these evidence-based treatments like TMS are important? Yes, actually, there's a special type of training that somebody has to undertake in order to be certified or credentialed to deliver TMS therapy. It's not a standard part of training to become a clinician, a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner or psychologist. It requires some additional training and learning about the brain and the physics and how the devices work and how to operate them safely, how to determine the dose, how to evaluate a medically safe and appropriate candidate for TMS therapy. So there are special uh, courses that are offered TMS clinicians should take in hospitals and university settings. There are often special credentials that people have to get and maintain to be qualified to give TMS therapy. And also the manufacturers of the devices will go around and train and certify 
uh, people to use the devices when they sell or lease a TMS device to a new clinic, they will typically be required to do some hands-on training with them. But it's definitely not in the category of writing a prescription or psychotherapy, which are standard tools that psychiatrists will typically have mastered when they finish their training and start their clinical practice. How can someone take advantage of this type of treatment? If someone wonders whether or not TMS therapy might be appropriate for them, the first thing to do is to find a clinician who is knowledgeable. And that's not the easiest thing to do. If the person who's treating your current symptoms doesn't know about TMS therapy, often people have to go to the internet and find some information. So going to websites of the device manufacturers is one way to get at least the FDA-approved market marketing message, which often includes some educational information. You can also find a TMS clinical practice nearby to where you are living or working and reach out to the TMS clinicians who are typically psychiatrists and ask for an evaluation. And that evaluation will involve learning a little bit about you and your symptoms to make sure that you don't have conditions which would make TMS unsafe to evaluate whether you have a disorder that is is under the rubric of what the FDA approves and the insurance coverage will pay for. So they're going to evaluate those things. And not only that, when somebody's evaluated for a course of TMS therapy, they should be asked to fill out some ratings forms or have some interviews where their depression symptoms or their OCD symptoms are quantified. And this is called measurement-based care. We get a number so that we know how severe your disorder and your symptoms are. Sort of like go into your primary care doctor's office and they take your temperature and they take a blood pressure. You have a number or a couple of numbers. Okay, those numbers are good or I want my numbers to be lower. And you can think about it that way. When you're evaluated for TMS therapy, there needs to be some metrics. There need to be some measurements. And typically that's a scale that you're going to fill out. It's going to ask you how significant is this problem? Insomnia. How significant is this problem? Mate, rate it on a one to four. Or how many days a week do you have anxiety? How much do you have problems with concentration? How much do you have problems with negative thoughts about yourself? How much do you have problems with feeling guilty or feeling remorse? So there will be all these different questions and you typically will fill out some scales and then there will be some numbers that quantify how severe your depression is. Insurance companies cover transcranial magnetic stimulation when the diagnosis is correct, that's major depressive disorder or in some cases OCD and I'll talk about OCD next. And then they make sure that you have the proper diagnosis, that you have symptoms that have typically not responded to a traditional course of antidepressant medication or psychotherapy. And they're thinking on that one is that, gee, if you could take a generic SSRI like paroxetine or citalopram or s citalopram for five cents a day, maybe that would be more convenient and more cost effective than driving to a clinic every day to get a TMS therapy session. Because a course of TMS therapy is one treatment every day, five days a week for six to nine weeks. Typically, the first 30 treatments you give Monday through Friday once a day. And then after that, there are six more treatments that you give three one week, two the next week, and one the following week. And that's called a taper phase. That's a typical course of treatment. Now, some people will get better before they hit six weeks of treatment, and you can taper off earlier. The taper phase, of course, is just to make sure that those benefits, the relief that you have from your symptoms are durable and are going to stick when you're tapering off the TMS. It's a fairly significant time investment, and it's not an inexpensive treatment. So the approvals and the policies for covering TMS specifically require that people have tried and failed at least one antidepressant medication. Some insurance companies require that you've tried it and not gotten better with a course of psychotherapy, for example, in addition to medications. So often when you're being evaluated, the provider will ask a lot of information and need details about the different medication trials that you've had so that they can evaluate whether you meet this criteria for treatment resistance. And then the same thing for OCD. Um, There are far fewer insurance companies that currently cover TMS for OCD. It's a, a more recent indication that's been FDA approved, but it's also approved again for individuals who have tried antidepressant medications and psychotherapy first. Those are the populations, the types of patients that participated in the studies where these treatments were shown to be safe and effective. And that's quite remarkable that they work for people who all were not getting better from the other standard treatments we have. 
So there's finding an access center near you. And because this is not a treatment that can use at home or away from the clinic, obstacles are living close enough to a clinic where you can get there five days a week and then finding out whether your insurance will cover your particular case. And again, that happens after the clinician who's going to deliver TMS therapy has had a chance to evaluate you and and they'll often submit information to the insurance through what's called a pre-authorization process. They gather all your information and they should tell you, yes, I think you're a good candidate or no, I don't think you're a good candidate. You could probably benefit maybe, but you're not going to qualify for insurance coverage. So there'd be different sorts of scenarios like that. And then the other thing that you need to do to take advantage of this treatment is be able to uh, get yourself to the clinic for a period of time every day for these treatments. Some clinics, I know the one that that I run here at Butler Hospital, are open from eight in the morning till about six o'clock in the evening. But some clinics may not be open as many hours or they may only have few hours of operation where they're delivering the treatments. So coordinating with the staff in the clinic so that you uh, get a treatment slot that works for you. And it's often popular for people who want to get a treatment on their way into work in the morning or on their way home. And then there are many people who are are not working, who are disabled as a result of their depression or for other reasons, don't want to come in when rush hour is happening. So those are the sorts of sort of logistic challenges that are involved in having a course of treatment being close enough and having a trained clinical providers in your area. There are hundreds of TMS clinics around the country now. And like I said, there are six different FDA approved devices. So different clinics use one or more of these different devices. The psychiatrist who's involved in overseeing the care should be specially trained, and usually they are, to deliver the treatment. And it's not the case that every large hospital or every large mental health clinic will have something like this available. It's still, even though it's been a decade, would you believe, it's still slow to reach some areas of the country. There's more barriers with regard to access just because of uh, how far people would have to travel to get to a clinic. Why is it more challenging if you have OCD to get insurance covered? So the insurance companies, once there's an FDA approval for a new disorder, they're often slow to come on board and decide they're going to cover. Just because something has been studied enough, a new treatment has been studied and shown to be effective, patients coming in, half of them are going to get a a sham treatment, which is like a fake treatment, sort of sounds and feels similar, but it's not the real thing. And the other half get the active treatment. And then after a number of weeks assessing their symptoms, you compare how did the people who got the sham treatment do compared to those who got the active treatment. And if there's a significant improvement in the group that got the real thing then meets a certain statistical threshold and we call that efficacy. And if it appeared to be safe, then the FDA says, okay, we can approve this. But the insurance companies say, hmm, I have a limited amount of healthcare dollars and I have to take care of millions of people and this is an expensive treatment. So I want to make sure that this works well enough that the evidence is really strong. I'm going to write it in my coverage policy for all of the payers under my umbrella, whatever that is, some sort of Blue Cross umbrella or United or Aetna or or Medicare or Medicaid or whatever. Oftentimes, the policymakers want some additional evidence. They're concerned that maybe the outcomes from the OCD trial either weren't robust enough or researchers called the response wasn't really that big a change, or it just may be taking them some time to see how is this going? Is it really working in real life clinical practice? And many companies, and particularly Medicaid, were very slow after TMS was first FDA approved now over a decade ago to bring out public coverage policies. And so I can't profess to be an expert on what are the forces that prompt them to roll out a new coverage policy. But it's been a couple of years since OCD and the device, again, it's not available at all clinics, the OCD device, but a little more sluggish in terms of insurance coverage. We, of course, hope that will pick up because as more people can get coverage, more people can access treatment, and then we have more information about how well it's working for our patients with OCD. And what about anxiety? And Has it shown any effectiveness with anxiety disorder? Anxiety is a symptom that cuts across a lot of different disorders. A lot of patients with major depressive disorder have very profound anxiety. And then people with OCD often have anxiety. And then there's some other anxiety disorders in our psychiatrist book of how we call disorders. There's one called generalized anxiety disorder, often abbreviated GAD. And there's panic disorder. And there are other sorts of anxiety disorders. None of these officially has an FDA approval. So if you just have anxiety, disorder, but you don't have all the other symptoms that make up major depressive disorder, 
then you would not be eligible for coverage. There are a number of studies, not as many as depression, which have started to examine how should we use TMS to treat anxiety disorder? How good are the outcomes? What is the safety like? But it hasn't yet been enough to go to the FDA and say, okay, is this going to be this treatment TMS with this particular device is going to be indicated for the treatment of a primary generalized anxiety disorder? Again, that being said, many patients have anxiety disorders plus depression or PTSD, which is another type of anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, often occurs in the same people who have major depressive disorder, major depression. So there's a lot of overlap across these. And certainly there's ample evidence that the anxiety symptoms respond very well to TMS therapy. Is there anybody this treatment is not appropriate for? If a person can get better with a inexpensive antidepressant pill, and there's no reason why they shouldn't take that pill, then it might not make general economic sense for them to spend all the time and money and insurance resources to get TMS therapy. Now, that being said, some specialized area where people can't take antidepressants, uh, medications, or don't want to. So, for example, if you're a, a pregnant woman or a nursing mother, or if you have other medical problems which make it impossible for you to take, some antidepressants have effects on heart function, or some have effects on other metabolic functions. So, so there are some people that really can't and to take antidepressants. Those are exceptions. And right now, there is not an FDA approval in a large evidence base for treatment of children with TMS therapy. There are some early clinical trials that have just been completed with adolescents. Research studies are ongoing, but it's quite unusual, not totally inappropriate, but quite unusual that adolescent will be approved for by their insurance for coverage with TMS therapy to treat their depression or OCD. It doesn't mean it won't work, but oftentimes it takes large bodies of data to shape policy. And there will be lots of exceptions where there's been a small study or a pilot trial or somebody's had some experience treating this or that disorder. They say, oh, I treated somebody with attention deficit disorder and it really got better. But until we have enough scientific data to say we are really confident that this is safe and it's effective, it's going to work for the majority of people that get this treatment, potential for someone to be harmed. Their disorder could get worse. It could not change. They could spend a lot of time, energy, and money getting a treatment and have their symptoms have a natural course of worsening over time. And some symptoms from some disorders can be exacerbated and made worse by TMS therapy, depending on what type of stimulation protocol is used and where the coil is put on the head. Patients, like I said, who have epilepsy or seizure disorders, those are going to be patients that we are not likely going to put a TMS coil and and stimulate at least with high frequency to treat their depression. Again, there are exceptions to every rule, but there are some cases where absolutely you're not going to do that. And I'll explain what those are now. So TMS is a magnetic field. And when you have metal next to it, metal conducts electricity. And if you put magnetic pulses on a piece of, near a piece of metal, you can induce current in that metal. So if you had a metal skull plate or a metal clip or some large metal thing up in your cranium right underneath where they're going to put the TMS coil, that could be dangerous. And it's not dissimilar, Bridget, to when you're going to have an MRI and they do a lot of questions to make sure that it's not unsafe for you to go into a magnetic resonance imaging scanner where they're going to scan your brain or some other part of your body, your knee or your back or something. They ask a lot of questions about metal and do you have any metal that's not removed like piercings and so forth, because the magnet can interact with that metal. It could either make it heat up or it could pull it and move it through your body. So those are the only real true contraindications. And again, even in those situations, there are types of metal that can be used, which are safe in the head. And it's just one of the things that would really slow you down and, and cause you to evaluate very carefully what the risks and potential benefits are. What about dental fillings? Dental fillings do not create a problem for TMS therapy. The magnetic pulses, they don't go a very long distance before they spread out and weaken off. So when you think about the coil is up on your head, dental fillings, even braces, dental implants don't create problems. If you have the type of earrings on that have ferromagnetic metal, that's kind of metal that might be attracted to a magnet, you can remove those for your session or you could take your glasses off if you needed to. If you had a piercing on your face very close to where the coil was going to go on your head, you might have have to remove that so that there was no risk of the magnetic pulses causing the your piercing, the metal of your piercing to heat up or pull or something like that. 
can you share a poignant example where TMS had a major impact in someone's life? What's so exciting about this is that TMS has a major impact on so many people's lives. I've been a psychiatrist for so many years, and my journey has always been working with people who don't get better with traditional medications and who are having type of illness we call treatment resistant. And to see people who've come in with decades of medication after medication get all the way better and have remission is just so exciting. And I remember one of the first people that I treated with TMS, I said, so tell me a little bit about what you'll be like when you're better. How will I know? What will you look like? What sorts of things will you do? And this woman said to me, Dr. Carpenter, I'm not really sure. I don't think I've ever actually been normal or not depressed. And I thought, hmm, I don't really know what baseline, what the healthy baseline looks like in this person. But nevertheless, we undertook a course of TMS therapy. And at the end, it was just profound for her to feel like, wow, for the first time in her life, and I think she was 43 when we did this, she's just described to me, you know, I've never seen the sky look so blue. I've never smelled spring so fragrantly. I've never just experienced things the way I do now. And it was interesting and sad to think that she had a very chronic, even when it was a low severity level of depression all her life. And so I see many people who feel, wow, they have a lot of, this is just transformative for them. And they cope better and they enjoy things better and they can socialize better and participate in every sphere of their life where they function as a partner, as a parent, as a child and in their work and in their play. And it's very, very exciting to be part of that. We don't really see that in a lot of the other kinds of treatment modalities that we currently offer. It is very exciting. Does a person have to come back for any tune-ups or any maintenance? Yes. So I'd like to tell anybody that I'm talking to about TMS therapy that your first question should be, how likely is this to work for me? And I like the doctor to be able to cite the studies and the data from the science. This is how much you map on to the people that were in the clinical trials or not. And then the next question I'd like people to ask me is, how long is the effect going to last? And then I say, we have no permanent cure for depression. And I repeat it again, we have no permanent cure for depression. Unfortunately, depression is a recurring, relapsing and chronic disease for many people. And we can get a lot of people better with PMS therapy. And then the next question is like, okay, well then how long will it last? Well, if you look at the available data, and again, we've here at at my hospital and research site, we've um, participated in these sorts of studies. If you look over the course of a year after people finish their TMS therapy, about a third of them will start to slip and have their symptoms come back and they'll need some tune-up. If you give TMS to those people again, a very high percentage, 90% approximately, will bounce back into response or remission and do beautifully. So if it works for you once, it'll work for you again. But we can't predict how long people will go until their symptoms come back. It might be, I have patients who have gone several years. I have some that have gone six months, and I have some that have been well for six weeks before their symptoms come back. Right now, the insurance companies don't cover maintenance therapy treatments with TMS, and that's primarily because the research hasn't really proven what's the right schedule to give it. Once a week, should you give it once a month? We did a study where we randomized people to once a month and it didn't seem to, for the entire group, be the best thing. Some people don't even need it in once a month. Uh, One of our research challenges now is to figure out how to customize the treatment so that people, when they're starting to slip, can get a maintenance top-up session or a group of sessions and not have to wait till they're all the way sick with severe depressive symptoms again until they qualify for a retreatment with TMS therapy. But the good news is if it worked the first time, it's highly likely to get you better again. That's great. What are you most excited about in mental health treatment today? I am really excited about all the ways that we are learning to use energy and devices to treat people. There's a whole new field of devices being developed. And what's really cool is that many of them will be ones that people can use at home and self-administer at home. And that will, I think, dramatically improve access. Learning how to use non-invasive stimulation, peripheral nerve stimulation, brain stimulation with magnetic energy, with electrical energy, with acoustic energy, with sound 
ground energy. There are a number of different types of devices. The innovation that's going on right now is just phenomenal and super exciting. Some of these, I think, and the way we're able to use large computational power and computing resources to detect signals, detect signals from sensors on your brain like we never could in the past and use artificial intelligence to determine sort of signals that tell us something. I feel like all of this can be harnessed and is being harnessed gradually, slowly in scientific work, be able to better diagnose uh, disorders, to be able to predict when people are going to get sick again before they get sick again, and to therefore be able to step in and do some preventative steps so that we can catch things before they get very serious. And of course, with depression, which is the area where I'm working in the most, depression is often a lethal disorder and it takes people's lives. Suicide is very real, just like people die of cancer. So I think that having new treatments, having new ways to understand the underlying brain signals and to intervene earlier, more we can prevent suffering and reduce the terrible outcomes that are associated with mental health problems is one of the most exciting things now. And it's really not just in the device world. I'm primarily in the device world with my research, but there are so many really fascinating drug development going on. Any people are familiar with the stories around ketamine and esketamine being an intranasal version, and then also the psychedelics, psilocybin, and how they might be able to facilitate healing the brain um, when combined with psychotherapy. I think there's, for decades, we've had drugs that all work through serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, and now we're really on the verge of new chemical systems and new energy systems. And that's a very, very exciting thing to see. I completely agree with that. If you had a magic wand and could improve one thing about mental health treatment today, what would it be? Well, if I had a really big magic wand, I might not want us to have any mental health problems at all, but I don't really know what that reality would be like. And for the reality that we live in, we need some things to move ourselves forward. We need more support for research. We need more training, not just for the people who are going to experience mental health disorders. And these are phenomenally common. One in 10 Americans has major depressive disorder at some point in their lifetime. That requires that we address stigma and realize that all of us are potential or currently are patients or clients that have mental health or behavioral health issues to deal with. In that, I would include the whole world of addictions as well and substance use disorders. So I think if we had uh, more resources to further the research and train people as well as the clinicians who provide care for them, it's phenomenal, but you get something new like TMS and it takes a full decade and still many people will say, my psychiatrist has never heard of TMS and they have to become the export, go on the internet and find it and then get some resources for their doctors. If I could wave a wand, I would have all the people providing healthcare be familiar with at least the truly effective and available new treatments that are out there and more resources for people to become educated and access them. So Dr. Carpenter, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people that you've helped through your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand the field of transcranial magnetic stimulation. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your important mission. And I appreciate your work too. So be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health. There you will also find how to submit questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system or suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There is no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want. 